I am a graduate student, Professor Sue Beyond's lab. Today I'll be discussing my work on profiling deep quadruplex formation uh, within double stranded DNA. So, just before we begin, let's establish exactly what a G quadruplex is, or G2 for short. Uh, it's a repetitive, guanine rich DNA sequence uh, that is composed of two parts. The first part uh, is four repeats of uh, guanine triplet, and these are separated by the second part, which is an intervening sequence that can be A, T, uh, G, or C, and these form the loops within this sequence, and they tend to be between one and seven bases in length. The real interest of the structure, though, really comes with its ability to kind of fold the three-dimensional prism-like structures in here. So these structures are typically categorized in one of two uh, different labels. And the first one here is a parallel G quadruplex, and we see the direction of the G triplets are up, 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 and up, while the next category is an anti-parallel G quadruplex, and we see the uh, these triplets are in actually opposite order, so it's up, down, up, down. So we're going to kind of put this into a biological perspective. There's over 400,000 potential G quadruplex sequences in the human genome. But more importantly uh, is their ability to modulate genetic expression. And to kind of go along with this, you can see that uh, where the G quadruplexes are located. And there's a 230-fold increase in prevalence uh, compared to the rest of the genome of finding G quadruplexes in color sequences. So the methodology on which uh, these G quadruplexes can alter genetic expression so during transcription, we have an RNA polymerase that binds to the transcription start set, starts producing mRNA, and from that we get this transcription bubble. This transcription bubble induces negative supercorneling in the upstream region of the uh, DNA, and that negative supercorneling induces a, a torsional strain. So it's been uh, proposed that a G quadruplex can form to alleviate that strain, and in that process, this three-dimensional structure can uh, steroid hinder transcriptional proteins from binding that region. So we can see how we can modulate genetic expression just through DNA alone. <coughs> so we'll talk a little bit about the current methodologies of studying G quadruplexes. So very popular techniques, well known, the NMR, circular dichroism, atomic force microscopy. But all these um, have one big limitation, and that's the context in which they study the DNA. It's all single stranded. As I said earlier, there's 400,000 possible sequences in the human genome, and they typically occur in a kind of context of a duplex area. So we see duplexes on both sides, along with this IOT sequence, which is just a complement to the G quadruplex. So with this in mind, our lab set out to kind of develop a technique that can rapidly assess the formation of G quadruplexes within this duplex context. So uh, the whole premise behind this uh, technique is that we utilize two probes, which are selected for parallel and anti-parallel. Uh, so we went through an extensive literature review, uh, looked at you know, hundreds of compounds that have been shown to interact with G quadruplexes, and selected two based on two properties. One, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to bind either a parallel or a, sorry, anti-parallel or parallel G quadruplex, and also to have an increased fluorescence of the molecule when binding to a G quadruplex. So what we see, uh, the first compound is NMM. It binds uh, preferentially to the uh, parallel structure. Next compound is crystal violet, and this binds to the antiparallel structure. So in order to validate that this method works, we tested it against several known single-stranded G quadruplexes. So these have been looked at through all the three previous techniques. And for NMM, we see sequence one and two, which are predominantly parallel and we see a high amount of fluorescence. So we see that this uh, matches. For CV, we see sequence three, which is an established anti-parallel sequence that shows high crystal violet fluorescence. And then finally, this fourth sequence is just a control, and we don't see any induced fluorescence. So this methodology seems to work. At this point, we uh, kind of further tested it in 20 different sequences, and we see this really nice clustering of uh, high NMM fluorescence correlating to parallel sequences in the opposite for CV. So now that it works, we have this you know, wonderful new tool. Uh, we decided to kind of go into the area that we were hoping to study, which was the G quadruplex formation within this duplex context. And so compared to the previous slide, you can see you know, the, the different construct we use here. There's an 18 mer on both sides, and with this intervening, I'm sorry, this IOT sequence present. Uh, we expected CD, I'm sorry, we expected CD and NM to behave properly, as you can see from this diagram, uh, behave as they previously did. As you can see from this diagram, sequence one and two, which were parallel and single strand, also seem to fold parallel G quadruplexes within this duplex context. 
The interesting kind of portion comes from crystal violet and looking and kind of probing of antiparallel exfoliant. And so we don't see any induced fluorescence. All the uh, sequences kind of have the same background level. And so this uh, kind of gives us one of two options. The first option is CD doesn't work within this duplex context. Or the second option is this anti-parallel G quad duplex cannot form within a duplex uh, kind of environment. So kind of to order and invest, investigate that further, we went back to a technique that's kind of a bread and butter technique for lab, single molecule fret. Uh, in this, we use basically the same constructs as we used earlier, but we append two uh, fluorophores. Uh, these are a fret pair. So the side three molecule here uh, is the donor molecule. And if we have a completely duplex system, there's a long distance between the donor and acceptor, which have a low fret bed. Now, when the G quad duplex forms, it compacts the, the structure, and we see uh, a lower or shorter distance between the two dyes, and this results in a high construction. So, to actually kind of look at some of the data that we've got out of this, these are once again previously tested uh, sequences that we did in NMM uh, and crystal violet, but they're labeled with anti parallel here and the rest of these in parallel. And we see this really nice trend. First of all, we see the high threat values here, suggesting quad duplex formation. And the low fret values here would suggest complete duplex. So if we uh, strictly focus on this anti parallel sequence, we don't see a high fret population. So this kind of goes back and uh, addresses that question if anti parallels are capable of holding within the duplex context. We test this for multiple sequences, we see the same on this. So the anti parallel structure is not capable of forming within this duplex context. Additionally, from this data set, we see that we can actually fit these graphs in an area of the curve to be able to compare your folded versus unfolded population, which uh, gives us kind of this uh, interesting results, which answers another question we had about NMM, uh, which was, does the difference in fluorescent due to a structural difference in HGQ or just due to the amount of uh, folded GQ that's actually present? So we can see for these parallel g duplexes here, we see a range between approximately 90% folding down to just over 50%. When we compare this to the NMM values that we see here, they, they correlate pretty well. So uh, at this point, we can kind of say NMM is a, a rough substitution for the folding percentages. And at this point, like any good scientist that has a technique that works, we try to scale it up and get some more data out of it. And I'd like to mention at this point, uh, CPLC uh, provided a mini grant in order to attempt scaling this up to a 96 volt plate. Uh, so we've modified the uh, protocol a little bit, but now we're capable of testing a lot more sequences. So at this point, uh, we've tested approximately 400 sequences, and we're getting some interesting results out of this. So before we talk about the experiment again, we want to pull up, this is a G quadruplex sequence. Uh, and so in this first experiment that we're showing here, uh, we're varying the length of these intervening loop sequences. So we're keeping it all T's, but it could be a 111 or a 444, and we can change from there. And what we see is increasing length of the intervening sequence has less propensity to fold. So that's it. We also see in single strand GQs, but it's nice to also see that in within the duplex. Additionally, we see this change when we change the base composition. So these are the same sequences, but we just tested them in, uh, sorry, the same sequence length, but we changed the composition. We can see that the Substituting uh, an A for T's within this really changes the uh, structural stability or the propensity for a G quad duplex to form. I'd like to also mention it looks very similar for C. So at this point, you can see there's a, kind of a steep transition here when the T is much more gradual. So that's kind of the highlighted area I'd like to point out. So at this point, I'm sure all of you are asking, everything we've done at this point has been in vitro. So does this carry over to in vivo setting? So really quickly, We've done some preliminary data where we've inserted a GQ forming region directly in front of a fluorescent protein. And we're able to see if the GQ alters the fluorescent protein expression. Really quickly, we can see anti parallel GQs uh, do not affect the expression of this protein, while strong parallel GQs, we can also see about approximately half of uh, fluorescence uh, production at that point. So to summarize, uh, we see that NMM and crystal violet uh, appropriate either parallel or anti parallel. Uh, Anti-parallel GQs are unable to form with the duplex DNA constructs. And finally, the preliminary E. coli results suggest that anti-parallel formation uh, in the in vivo setting is not involved in genetic uh, modulation. At that point, I'd like to thank the Beyond Lab. I think just about everyone in this photo has actually been involved in the project at some point, and I'd like to open up for any questions. Questions from the audience?
I'm intrigued by the so the fact that the anti-parallel G quadruplexes don't seem to form. Is that do you think just some kind of topological problem that the so that there's can't work that out? So there's kind of two two areas. You take a look at it just strictly kind of physically that in single stranded GQs, the anti parallel structure tends to be less stable. So the melting temperature is lower, uh, they tend to fold and unfold more rapidly. In a biological context, it's kind of interesting because your telomeric repeats, so the anti capping of your chromosomes, actually is a G quadruplex structure, it's TTA, GGG, and repeats. And those have been shown to fold in anti parallel and single stranded. And so you have long, long runs of these. And so it's interesting to see that this anti parallel structure doesn't fold because you would expect it did have just basically G quadruplex after G quadruplex after G quadruplex So perhaps you said it, I mean, the, perhaps you said it, the opposing strand, I mean, that it, it is complementary, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Could it simply be that it just, I guess I'm wondering, it must be a relative stability thing of the G quadruplex versus the perfect base pairing. So maybe the base pairing is just more strong. Uh, so the base pairing is stronger. <laughs> And we've shown that. So uh, typically, to induce the formation of these, they have to be in a molecular crop before pop condition. So then, when we go down to an anti-parallel structure, it's even less less weak. So there's um, the idea is that even if it does form, it rapidly unfolds and duplexes out. Oh, so where you mentioned crystal violet, which has antibacterial, antifungal, and is is that through this process? And in general, how specific and potent? is crystal violet for the anti-parallel structure. So for the anti-parallel structure, um, well, that's the second question first. Sure. Um, it's very specific. So we can, I believe when we calculated it, it's about seven times higher than the background of a uh, parallel structure. Um, for the antibacterial aspects of that, I really can't uh, go too far into that. <coughs> it's not my area of expertise. But uh, that's kind of one of the interesting things that we found that it seems to be more involved in, I believe, protein staining at that point, and then uh, it's just kind of secondary. So, so it has multiple effects, yeah. one of which is the AP, but it's yeah. not specific for that thing. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.